ladies and gentlemen, thanks ever so much for persisting with us, and it's an honor to be here to chair this event at the web. As you probably noticed from your schedule um, today, my name is Nina Dos Santos. I'm the anchor of a twice-daily live business show on CNN called World Business Today. And what we're going to be examining here over the course of the next 30 minutes is the role that small startups can play in funding other small startups and funding marketplaces, what they can play. So obviously the uh, topic of our discussions today is surrounded around the subject of disrupted finance. Some people like you, Errol, like calling it reimagined finance, reinvented finance. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce my panel of guests. So first off, on my left here, we have Samir Desai, who's the CEO and founder of The Funding Circle. This is a marketplace that allows people to lend to companies. Um, we also have on his left here, Renaud Laplanche, who is the CEO uh, of The Lending Club, a United States-based business, which is slightly different in the sense that Essentially, what you do is you allow people to invest in other individuals and lend to other individuals, but you're also a marketplace. And then we have Wonga's founder and CEO, Errol Damelin. Um, and you're going to be going into the area of small to medium-sized enterprises as well. Obviously, you're best known for the sort of payday loans, short-term loans, etc. So uh, let me start with you, first of all, Errol. Now, Wonga, it's a rather controversial business model especially when it comes to lending to individuals. I understand that your most successful basic product is a 14-day loan that has an APR of about 4,000%. Some people have called you legal loan sharks. What do you say to that kind of criticism? So, the, you know, the, what, we, what we do at Wonga is try and use technology to help people solve Financial, pro financial challenges that they're having. And the core product focuses on individuals, and, our core, and that product has a term of up to 30 days, but it's a daily loan. And so the way APR is calculated assumes that you're compounding for 360 days. We don't compound, and it goes up to a maximum of 30 days, and it goes an average of 14 days. So the APR itself isn't an issue. The, 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 the question really is a question of context and about people making decisions around how they solve short-term cash flow problems. And we've seen through surveys and our experience here that you know, up to half of the population in the UK has occasional short-term cash flow problems. So the issue isn't one that we can, as a society, sweep under the rug. We need to think about it and deal with it. And the way, sorry, the way we deal with it is through transparency. And I challenge anybody to go to the Wonga website or download our iPhone app and Android apps and see the transparency. We've been quite transformative, I hope, in terms of bring, taking that to the next level. You say that, but then again, about sort of two-thirds of the people who borrow from payday loan companies, companies like Wonga, are actually people who can't get credit anywhere else. They use the money to pay household bills, the essentials, and then they get caught in this debt spiral. Well, in the case of Wonga, that's simply not true, Nina. So the, you know, Wonga isn't a payday loan company. Wonga is an alternative fundamentally to overdrafts from banks. So 76% of our customers are not looking for short-term loans. They're looking for alternatives to falling into overdraft late fees. And our, our fees at Wonga are substantially lower than the fees that banks and Lloyds and RBS and other mainstream banks in the UK charge customers for going over their overdraft limit. About a quarter of customers then use it as an alternative to payday loans. And Wonga is not a payday lender. Wonga is a daily, the corporate is a daily loan, which isn't just semantics, it's, it's very real. 25% of our customers pay back early before the period that they take the loan from. And in our case, every single person, people are banked, people are employed. We use, we, we take eight, we use 8,000 pieces of data to make a credit decision, and we reject two-thirds of applicants. So we're being very careful on how we do credit scoring and checking, and we've taken that to the next level in the UK, quite frankly. Let's move along and go over to Renaud Laplanche. How careful are you about how you do the credit scoring, particularly in the United States. I mean, taking a look at your website, there's a lot of loans there that are recent loans because, of course, you're a new business and you're growing, but the longer those loans are outstanding, the less likely it is people are going to pay them back. <coughs> yeah, so uh, at Lending Club, so Lending Club, just to, um, to um, give some context, is a platform that originates uh, loans to prime consumers online and lets investors invest in the loans directly at the time of, of origination and to really disintermediate the, the banks and use technology to lower costs. 
Um, so we make loans to people with good credit uh, who have plenty of other options, uh, but we make that credit uh, more affordable, lower cost than um, these consumers would, would pay at the bank. Uh, so now we have about five years of track record, five years of data uh, that shows the repayment rate. Um, and most of our loans are three-year term. Um, so with five years of data, we, we feel we have enough to get a good grasp on, uh, on What's the rate. default rate like? I'm sorry? The default rate. Um, so default rate on a three-year loan is about 3% 3 a year. So the quick math is um, the average interest rate is 13 to 14%. To you get 3% uh, default a year on a three-year loan. 1% uh, fee, and so you, investors have been earning 9 to 10% net of fees and net of credit losses. And your average rates are somewhere between 7 and 12%, right? Um, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's slightly higher than that, it's about 13%. Now, if we come back to you, I'll, I'll come to you, Samir, in just a second, but if we come back to you, Errol, so 4,000% APR, perhaps for individual small short-term loans in the individual market, you can't scale that to a business market. How much are you going to charge small to medium-sized enterprises? So we, we start in the business side at 16%, 16.6%, I think it is exactly, and it goes up, and the, the, way, the range of it is between 3 and 20 pounds per thousand per week. And so, yeah, I challenge you know, just yourself you know, if, to lend to businesses at less than that. It's non-trivial. You know, these are sm still small loans. Businesses can take them for up to 52 weeks in weekly in in increments. They're quite different loan sizes in terms to, to these guys here who are also playing an important role in the ecosystem as it evolves. And we're going up to 12 months, and these loans generally start at 12 months. They're just smaller, more short-term, but the, you know, at between 3 and 20 pounds per thousand per week. You know, that feels like good value, and that's what, you know, we did a lot of research in this space, and that's what small businesses were telling us, that they would be more than happy to pay for an online process where funding was available within 15 minutes, 24 hours a day. I mean, that, that's quite a significant amount of convenience that people are paying for and speed. So, yeah, that, that's where we are on the small business loans. That's not particularly pricey, I don't think. I want to come back to that issue of the sort of funding ecosystem, because that is what we're seeing changing. We're currently stuck in a world where after the credit crunch in 2008, we're seeing a sovereign crunch that could translate back to another credit crunch and mm -hmm. small businesses will suffer. Coming to your business, um, Samir, it's really, really interesting. What you're doing is you're offering a marketplace for people to invest in businesses in the short to medium term. How successful is that? Um, well, not as successful as these guys so far, but um, you know, we launched a lot later. I mean, we lend about uh, a million pounds a week now to businesses in the UK. Um, it's growing at 400% a year. Um, and I think um, what's really powerful about what we do is in the UK, 90% of all lending to small businesses is done by five banks. So there's really not many alternatives out there. Um, and by providing a marketplace, we don't just enable individuals, but anyone. So eventually pension funds, um, the UK government recently announced that it was actually considering lending on peer-to-peer -peer platforms directly to businesses. So it's kind of like a democratization of, of finance, really. You're taking something that was only available to five banks and making it available to everyone. Where do you get your funding from? Um, so all the people that lend, all, all the loans are funded at the moment by retail investors. So people like you and me, um, you can lend as little as £20 to each business. Um, so it's really not just for you know, high net worth individuals. Um, and we're looking to broaden out that, that base, um, get more institutional participation and also and hopefully government in the next few months. How long did it take you for sort of wannabe technology entrepreneurs, perhaps interested in this growing finance marketplace, how long did it take you to set up a business like that? And where did you get the money from? Um, so we got our initial money from um, a load of angel investors in the UK. Um, it took us a long time. Um, we had to spend a long time with the FSA, nearly a year, um, talking to them about the regulatory structure of the market. Um, it took us three months just to find businesses willing to... Because, you know, you, you go to these businesses um, and you need to do these kind of anti-money laundering checks and fraud checks. So you say to them, oh, can you, can you send in your passport details, your proof of address? And there's just a holding page on the internet. So, you know, admit, you know a lot of guys just said, well, you know, you look like you're trying to scam us out of money. So that was, it was actually very difficult to get the first businesses to even try out the platform. Because of a branding issue, basically, as you were saying, it's dominated by the big names in the financial space. 
Yeah, I mean, it's because it's a new thing, you know, as I said before, businesses aren't used to borrowing in different ways than, than through banks. They're not, they're not really used to borrowing on the internet at all. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the other powerful things that's been happening recently is, um, you know, one of the big things about the financial sector, and probably why it wasn't disrupted that much until now, is there was a huge amount of trust and satisfaction with, with banks. You know, people trusted banks. Um, and I think since the financial crisis, actually, a lot of people are willing to try new things, even, you know, business owners. That's certainly an excellent point. I see you nodding there, Renaud Laplanche. Do you agree, especially in the United States, which is obviously where the credit crunch began? I think that's right. The credit crunch and the, the financial crisis um, has had a, a lot of impact on our business. Um, I mean, there's certainly an emotional appeal of Lending Club from, from our customers who tell us everything else being equal, I would rather pay interest to people like me and go through the Lending Club rather than paying interest to Citibank or Bank of America. Um, so there's that emotional aspect. There's also a, a more sort of rational uh, basis. Um, the, many of the loans that we make are a replacement for a credit card. And credit card rates in the US have been pushed uh, even higher than they used to be by some of the new regulations that were enacted after the financial crisis. So there's a Card Act of 2009 and then Dodd-Frank. Um, that, that prevented the credit card issuers from charging some of the fees that they used to charge. Um, so they made that up by uh, increasing rates across the board. Um, so interest rates on credit cards have gone up to 16 to 18%, which really creates a lot of room for us to operate and to deliver value to, to our customers. Yeah, that's the argument, isn't it? If you have a credit card bill that's charging 14%, compound interest every month, and you can borrow from you to refinance that at 9%, obviously, right. that is a help. Some of your customers, though, are people who have already exhausted their uh, wiggle room with the credit card companies as well, though, aren't they? Um, no, not so much. I mean, we have very uh, tight credit um, policy, so uh, we decline. Unfortunately, we decline more than 90% of all the loan applications we receive. Um, and so among the credit criteria, uh, so there's a credit score, but there's also a utilization under the, the credit uh, authorization. And someone who'd already be maxed out on a credit card, unfortunately, unfortunately would be unlikely to, uh, to meet our credit standards. Errol, let me come to you. So sort of navigating this space between lending to individuals on short-term basis, albeit at a high interest, and then lending to a business at a lower interest for a longer time, because obviously to set up a business, it takes years. Where can you make this work for a company like Wonga? You know, we, we spend more time thinking about how we make it work for the customer. And, and so, you know, we think of ourselves as a digital finance company. It's about how do we use technology and data to provide better services for customers. And so uh, you won't find us mimicking other people's products. When we created a consumer product, it was different to a bank overdraft and different to payday loans. It was a different kind of product. And equally in the business space, we've looked at what we can do to help small businesses and focus on a very specific piece of that uh, problem, which is this, that cash flow gap that is generally weeks or months and not long term. So Wonga isn't a copy of a bank overdraft for a business or an individual or a long-term loan. It's something it's very special. It's about how we use technology and data to create speed and convenience, both for small business owners as well as for individuals. And so we price accordingly. You know, the, the, to your question, the, the pricing on the consumer product is thought of much more I think accurately as the revenue per loan, as the cost per loan, not the APR, and equally for the small business. Because the loan sizes are bigger and they have longer duration, we can afford to charge less because a lot of the fixed costs exist for a very small loan. So when we crunch 8,000 pieces of data, that costs money, and when you're only borrowing 100 pounds for seven days, it, there's, the fees add up. With business, we are able to spread that out, and we're really happy to do that. And so we're doing it at the lowest, you know, the lowest economics that makes sense, I think. But it doesn't necessarily present synergies, does it? Because if you're lending in the individual market to people who have no credit history whatsoever, 
businesses, you need a completely different approach, don't you? Well, our, our customers absolutely do have credit history. So we are not talking about unbanked or un, yeah, customers out there. We, if we can't get that quantum of data, we unfortunately have to decline people also. And that's amongst the two thirds of people that we decline. So we're very selective on the consumer side. Our insight on the, on the, on the entrepreneur business side is that we feel that entrepreneurs display similar characteristics in their business life to their personal lives. And so we're using the fact that we've now made over five million loans in the UK and accumulated pretty huge amounts of data around, around how individuals operate and what their propensity is to repay and using that specifically with entrepreneur-led businesses. But those are the businesses we're looking to fund. We're not looking to fund complex corporate structures because we, we just don't understand nearly enough about that space. But you know, when, when the focus is on the individual entrepreneur, we feel like we have got some unique insight. Samir, so, I just want to come back to what you were saying about the sort of lack of trust in them, some of the better known financial institutions. How big do you see this kind of marketplace that you in the funding circle are currently involved in becoming eventually, and how big is it today? Um, well, as I said, we lend about a million pounds a week at the moment. Um, the business lending market itself, you know, estimates of, it, of its size in the UK range from 100 to 300 billion. And um, there's no reason why we can't be a substantial portion of the market. I mean, one of the other analogies I like to use is um, if you're a big business, you don't have to go and borrow from a bank. You can go to a, a bond market or a syndicated loan market and borrow the money directly from investors. Um, and those markets are between 20 and 40% of, of big business finance, depending on where you are in the world. Um, one of the other powerful things about um, kind of the funding circle or marketplace model is um, the capital requirements are, are very, very light. So you know, we don't actually lend any money ourselves to businesses. But we've, um, we've been able to facilitate you know, around 37 million pounds of, of lending, um, lending directly to these businesses. So you know, there's no reason why these things can't be, can't be absolutely not huge. So what criteria do you look for here in terms of taking people as customers who may well invest in other people's businesses? It's sort of an anonymous barrier, isn't it? But what, what, what do you look for? to try and make sure that it has a seal of approval so that if somebody's investing money in one of your customers, they know that they're going to get it back? Um, well, they don't know they're going to get it back. Um, but well, um, we, have, um, <laughs> we have credit underwriters that um, assess the loans. We're developing credit models through, through data, um, and we're accumulating more and more data, so we're getting better and better at that as well. Um, the other thing is what we, what we allow the investors to do is very easily spread their money across lots and lots of different businesses. So again, you know, um, angel investors have been lending to businesses for you know, hundreds of years. But what we've allowed them to do is lend to lots and lots of businesses very, very easily so they can build a portfolio and spread their risk. Bruno, you're, as I was saying, in the sort of individual version of what Samir is doing, albeit, as he said, bigger. Is the individual market more attractive than the corporate market, or is it somewhere where you're going to be expanding eventually as well? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if it's more attractive. Uh, it's really the, um, the, the market we started with. Um, so we, we might at some point do business loans, but um, to the point that has been made earlier, it's quite different in terms of underwriting, in terms of acquisition channels. Um, so, so right now we're really focusing on the consumer market. Um, it is uh, the U.S. consumer credit market is a big market. Uh, it's about two, $2.4 trillion. Um, so we, we're not going to saturate that market anytime soon. Is it easier to get the capital from people to invest, let's say, in lending to other people, or is it easier to attract people who need loans? One would have thought the latter, right? And what's the proportion? So the, the dynamics are very different. Um, on the investor side, it, it took uh, really a couple of years to build up confidence um, and um, sort of really have built the track record that investors are now relying on. Uh, but now with that track record, with the economy doing better, uh, with um, a lot of investors, so starting small and then adding to their account over time and referring other customers. So it's both viral and, and repeat customers. While on the borrower side, um, we, we decline 90% of, of, of the loan request, right? so we need to generate um, 
like this month, we're going to issue $50 million in loans. We need to generate $500 million in loan applications. Um, and those are for the first time, for, for, the, for the most part, uh, first time customers, right? So there's no repeat business on, on that side. So the dynamics are different, um, but again, big markets on both sides. So we're, we're doing okay. Oh, let me come to you. Um, there's been a lot of reports about whether or not your company will be floated on the stock market. Would that not make it more important for your company to make more money off individual loans and individual and in loans to companies? What's your response to that? No, so there are no plans at the moment to list and at all. So the you know that's not a it's not a current issue we're dealing with. And in general, no. I mean, we, we're fortunate in that our core economics are strong in any case. And uh, yeah, I think we'll be fine with that. We're not, you know, as we're looking at new product areas and as we evolve as a business, it's about looking at the landscape and how you connect the, this digital revolution with finance and where the opportunities look. It's really not about looking for more economic rent from a particular space. And I think the really interesting thing here is that you've got three examples of companies that are taking advantage of this collision between digital and finance. And you know, media in your, in your industry has been transformed completely. And I think this is taking longer because of regulation that gives, you know, it's kept some of the old guys in business maybe longer than they would have been in business based on customer feedback and customer you know, loyalty. But there, you know, but there is definitely a change. And you can see you know, there, there are a dozen companies around the world that are really interesting, that are using innovative models, that are using much more data, that are building new models of trust and interaction. And you know, the, the ability to get onto an iPhone app and be able to sort out a cash flow problem and walk to an ATM and get money out is, was unthinkable Year, a, few, a couple of years ago, the ability to let individual investors have access to returns against businesses was impossible. And so I think the space is one of the most exciting spaces to be in for the next for the next decade, quite frankly, as this collision happens. And I think for all of us, there's, there are massive opportunities. And it's not really about looking for the next incremental, you know, small opportunity. There are big opportunities out there for us. And I hate to say it, but some of your critics might say, well, this could be creating a debt trap for companies as opposed to individuals. What do you say to that? Again. No, look, I think we need to move beyond, beyond uh, you know, throwing wor you know, words around. Like, I mean, the, the reality is that individuals and companies run short of cash from time to time, have ambition to do different things, they want to invest in capital or in opportunities as much as individuals want to, and we need to find a way as a society to enable that kind of opportunity for businesses and that social mobility for individuals. Because if there isn't credit available, you know, society, the retail sector grinds to a halt and people's opportunities grind to a halt. And so the issue is then how to provide, and for me, it's all about transparency. It's about being realistic and being able to be transparent. And I think if, if, we, do, if we bring anything to the sector, it's that I'd really love to have left an impact here on the traditional, on credit cards and on, on, on overdraft fees from banks and credit card companies so that they become much more transparent. And hopefully we change customer expectations around that. And yeah, if that's our legacy, that would, that would be fantastic. And that is the key. Credit at the moment may just not be available in the quantities that it's required. Let me open up the uh, floor to questions here. I'm afraid to say it's slightly difficult to see some of you behind the lights, but please just raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. I should be able to get to you. There we go. Um, can I just ask um, people to keep their questions as brief as possible because we've got about seven minutes left. Thanks. Hi, guys. Um, a lot of you mentioned that the FSA is something you had to go through for <coughs> Google. And Samir, uh, I've heard a lot about your headaches through FSA. How much of that has really stopped the, the blue sky and the visions that you had, the innovation <coughs> that you wanted to do? So, I mean, how much of that has kind of pulled it back? Um, well, so, um, we spent, when we were originally told them about the FSA, we were told, um, just write a letter to them, um, and if they don't respond, it's kind of fine, so just go and do it. Um, and I didn't really want to quit. <laughs> my job, and certainly my co-founders didn't really want to quit our jobs unless we had a letter, <coughs> so something in writing. So we spent a long time just basically badgering them to give us a response, and that, that was probably the most, most difficult bit. 
Um, Funding Circle is actually an unregulated business, so we're not regulated by the FSA, um, which um, was actually not the result we originally wanted when we, when we went to them. Um, but I think we've, we've kind of plowed ahead. Um, we've set up an association with some other um, firms that are slightly different to us, um, but similar enough, where we're putting in place minimum capital requirements, um, segregated climate, basically doing all the stuff that the FSA would expect. Um, and in the next few years, I expect it to become a regulated space. Any other questions? Nope. I want to pick up on that point you were making, actually. Um, regulation, and we'll bring in Errol in a second, because I'm sure you all have something to say about this. Financial regulation is supposedly on the up, especially in the world's biggest economy, America. Um, where do we reach this balancing act where we get enough regulation to make sure that, especially in a fragmented market like the one you're suggesting creating, there is enough to be responsible, but not too much to stifle very small companies? First of all, Samir. Well, um, well it's a very difficult question. I mean, personally, from my perspective, um, I think regulation is actually protecting the incumbents at the moment. Um, you know, we have... Um, we have a lot of people that participate on our marketplace, but um, a lot of people who will actually say, well, you know, you're not regulated by the FSA, you haven't got this badge of approval, um, which means that they don't, they don't participate. So uh, the way we see it at the moment in the UK, it is actually kind of protecting the incumbents and protecting. I can see, um, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult question to answer, to be honest, in terms of the balancing act. So you'd advocate less regulation. Surprise, surprise for somebody in the finance business. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's a bit strange because we kind of we want more regulation of, of our space. Um, we're probably the only company in history to be asking for more okay, regulation. So what, what kind of regulation? I noticed that you have tabled a number of acts of the government to try and support small businesses, to try and help create a marketplace for putting people yeah. together. I mean, it, it's because, it, you know, again, we, we talk about this stuff about trust. You know, we're in the trust business, you know. Um, a bank doesn't exist if everyone goes to the bank and takes out the money. And, and with Funding Circle, we have this marketplace where, you know, the investors have to trust us that we're screening the loans, we're doing what we say we're doing, um, and we have to foster that. Um, now, if a, you know, a rogue operator or someone came along, that could quite easily destroy the trust, uh, trust in our industry. So, you know, the kinds of things that we do are, you know, we segregate client money from our own money, which is what you know, all financial firms do. Um, we have an S&P rated backup servicer, so if Funding Circle ceases to trade, they'll step into our shoes and make sure everyone gets their money back. Um, you know, in terms of minimum capital requirements, stuff like that. So it's basic stuff that I think everyone would, would expect to see, really. Runa, obviously you're in the United States. It's very, very delicate balancing act between whether or not they're going to introduce more severe financial regulation at the moment. How do you see things going forward and how would that affect your business? What is it you would advocate? So, actually, I think the um, US financial system uh, has actually the right level of, of regulation right now. Uh, there's, a, there's a pretty healthy push and pull uh, in the US between the, uh, um, <laughs> the two sides uh, of the, uh, the political uh, spectrum. Um, and um, so, it, as far as we're concerned, we, um, we're mostly regulated by the SEC. Uh, in our relationship with, with investors. And, and the SEC, I think, is the right kind of regulator that doesn't tell you what to do, doesn't tell you how to run your business. Um, they won't just want to make sure that the risks are properly disclosed to investors. Um, and so we, we make <coughs> additional efforts uh, to disclose risks, not only in the prospectus, which is a long uh, document that not all investors read, uh, but we, we try to make the information more transparent, more accessible, more easy, uh, easier to, uh, um, to, uh, to understand on, on our website itself. Uh, so we, we go even beyond some of the requirements of, of the SEC. But I suppose, as Samir was just saying, to a certain extent, regulation does protect the incumbents, and maybe not specifically in the United States, but if we were to see more regulation for the big institutions on Wall Street, that would open up the, full, the, the fray to people like you, smaller, smaller institutions for individual lending. 
I don't know if I agree to, to that statement in, in, in the US. I, I don't think regulations are more favorable to the big banks. For example, I think they, they've had their fair share of, of regulation and oversight and, and uh, a lot of constraints that have been imposed to, to the big banks over the last few years. Uh, I think for the most part, we've, we're, we've been able to uh, be sort of highly regulated for, for good reasons, because we deal with people's money. Um, but, but to operate in an environment where we have the flexibility to use sort of new technologies and, and bring innovative products to, to market. Errol, let me come to you and give you the last word here. As one of Wonga's pearls of wisdom, what would you give our audience today if they wanted to enter this market? How valuable will this market be eventually to small to medium-sized enterprises? You know, I, no, nobody has a really good sense of, of, of exact size because the, when you make new offerings available to people that they didn't have before, you redefine what's possible and how you think about a market. So if you think about what Facebook's opportunity is today, and you looked at it 10 years ago, it would be really difficult to understand what it looked like because the market's being created. And I think to the extent that we're trying to create new products, we're creating new alternatives. The market is very big. I mean, there isn't, you know, the, all of these markets are innovating at the fringes of a massive financial services industry that is worth trillions of dollars. So, you know, to the extent we're all very, very small and trying to innovate around the edges, you know, we really need to be, as regulators and stakeholders, trying to encourage companies like us providing better alternatives, in my view. So the one response of regulators to the crisis in 2008 was to look backwards at how to avoid that same problem happening again. I think what, while that's important, right, to some extent, I think what's really important is that they look to establishing frameworks that encourage new players yeah, coming into markets and challenging the incumbents. Because as Samir alluded to, you know, the current regulatory frameworks really do support the incumbents and, and they're fairly anti-innovation. And you know, that, that's what we encourage government and, and regulators to look at when we, whenever we talk to them. Okay, so a call for less regulation then? No, no, not less no. regulation. I think it's really important more that there's regulation. regulation. I think the regulation should be more customer-centric. I think we should sit back and not look at the technical regulation only, but think about whether customers are getting a fair deal and focus on, on that, on transparency and on the customer, and think about how we help ensure that customers can trust again. And, and for me, that definitely means that there's a lot of there's regulation. It's just more customer-centric. Okay, on that note, it's time to wrap it up here, I'm afraid. Thanks ever so much to my three guests here, Samir Desai, CEO and founder of The Funding Circle, also Renaud Laplanche there from the Lending Club of in the United States, and Errol Damlin, the founder and CEO of Wonga. Thanks ever so much for joining us for the last half hour to listen about disrupted finance. And Nina, thank you very much.